Well, uh, welcome to uh, our January uh, live class. Uh, this is Mike Cutchins here at the University of Illinois welcoming you to our uh, hour-long program. I think we have a hopefully informative and educational uh, program planned for you. Uh, first of all, we are going to uh, go through our two case studies, case study 21 and case study 22. Several of you have looked at that and have responded to that as well. We then have a short program on our uh, feeding guidebook that some of you may or may not be aware of that's available uh, to be ordered as far as that goes. And as always, to answer some of your questions or concerns you may want to raise uh, on uh, information about dairy production or the dairy class or individual situations as well. So those are the marching orders we'd like to do uh, uh, this uh, today, and uh, we are pleased to have you online as well. Weather-wise, uh, it's really cold in Illinois. Uh, we're going to be down to uh, 9 degrees Fahrenheit tonight. I'll let you uh, uh, metric people convert that over to Celsius. And then the, the wind chill on top of that will get it to about a minus 10 degrees with the wind chill, which includes the, the, the air temperature and the wind velocity. So it's going to be a cold night for our dairy cattle here in Illinois as far as that goes. Well, hopefully it's warmer where you're living, and so let's get rolling here. Today. I'm going to go down here and click on, hopefully uh, it'll come right up for me. And uh, here we go. This is our first case study. This is case study um, uh, 21, as we call it, or basically far off dry cow module. In this case study, you were asked uh, to, uh, if you were asked to evaluate and balance a far off dry cow program, a list of three factors that you feel are important to get an optimal diet for those for those animals out there on um, uh, on the farm that you're working with. And so here would be my questions that I would come up, and they're not in a rank order, but certainly are going to be important. Uh, one of the first things that I guess you would want to do when you visit the farm is to look at body condition score of the dry cows, uh, especially those that are uh, 60, 50 days away from calving or just dried off recently as far as that goes. If that body condition score is over 3.5, then I think that's going to be a real challenge for you. Uh, you cannot take weight off these cows, but of course the goal is not to allow these cows to gain any more weight as far as that goes uh, in, in the, during the dry cow period. Uh, you may want to go back, if you see them heavy in the dry cow pen, you may want to go back to cows in late lactation and see, in fact, if they are getting heavier while they're still producing milk, which means the correction has to occur in the last 100 days before drying off. Once they get to the dry cow pen, there's very little you and I can do to change that. I did work with a very large herd in Mexico, though, several years ago, and we, we took the dry cows and we broke them into two groups. Uh, one was called the thin dry cow group. Uh, these are cows that are under body condition score three. And then those that are body condition score adequate or heavy, over three. And those that were under three, they got an extra two or three kilograms of a processed shell corn uh, for 40 days before they went to the close-up pen. And that was to put some weight gain on these cows to take them maybe from a 275 up to three or, or a, a light three up to maybe three and a quarter as far as that goes. The interesting thing, though, not all cows would gain weight. And the common denominator were lame cows. So if the cows were lame, even though we gave them an extra two plus kilos of corn in their dry cow diet, uh, they still didn't gain weight. Uh, those cows that were not lame, they in 40 days, they would pick up adequate body condition score. And if they're going to be dry for another 30 or 40 days, we had to move them out of that pen and get them off the extra corn because that was going to create a problem getting, getting them too heavy for another 30 or 40 days. A second question I would ask uh, of, of the farm, and that is, would you consider using what we call the low energy or the high straw diet or also called the Goldilocks diet as far as that goes? What that does is that you're adding typically about uh, a two or three kilograms of straw to bulk up the diet so cows can eat all they want to eat, but they will not gain excessive weight because the energy density is about 1.3 megacals per kilogram of dry matter. And uh, that uh, will then target, that's the other important number, if you use this program, if they're Holsteins, they should be eating somewhere around 12 or 13 kilograms of dry matter. If they eat less than 10, now you're going to have a problem because now uh, dry matter is limiting and intake is limiting and these cows are going to be metabolically in, in a bit of a challenge. 
Certainly uh, the third factor I would do, and that is uh, this would be up to you as the nutritionist, uh, can you fine tune the diet using a rumen model, especially getting adequate levels of protein and energy into these cows and trace minerals and vitamins into the feeding program? Uh, you could use uh, some uh, uh, urea if necessary, depending on what the base forages are going to be. Uh, another question is, oh, how long are they keeping them in the far off diet? Uh, normally, that'll be about 40 days on most farms. But if it's going to be uh, shorter or longer, you don't have to make some type of adjustment in terms of where you move them and how fast you move them along as far as that goes. Of course, if you look at the case study, uh, certainly organic trace minerals, especially selenium, are right at the top of my list there. Extra vitamin E is also recommended. And of course, rumenzin or one of the ionophores uh, would be a useful product to have in there to get improved feed efficiency in that time of period. The last comment would be, what about twinning? Do they have many cows on the farm, uh, cows that have twins? That's fairly common, uh, uh, third and fourth lactation cows to have a higher incidence of twinning. And if those cows are carrying two, two calves or two fetuses, then we suggest moving them into the close-up ration and to get that extra nutrients to those animals as well. So those would be the questions I'd be asking of the uh, on the case study one. And again, let's do case study uh, number 22. And then if there are some questions, you can uh, send those in to Jose and we'll try to answer them as well. So stay, stay with me here and hopefully we will uh, be able to get to case study 22. And uh, let's see what we have here. Okay, something didn't go right. So Mike, let's uh, go back and find it. Just uh, bear with me. You are not talking to a very technical savvy uh, person here. Uh, okay, that's not what's supposed to be there. Case study 22. I went back to the original and uh, let's see. We are going to try one more time and then, and then I'll just read it to you. The case study 21. Let's see what's going to happen here. On, um, on that. And uh, one more try, Mike. And if that doesn't work, we are going to go to uh, read it to you. Okay, stay with me. Uh, case study uh, 20, uh, 22. I will read it to you. It's very short as well. So it says, uh, uh, same question, uh, but now we're going to do a close-up diet. What, what uh, three factors would you look at when you are looking at a close-up ration last 21 days before calving? And so here are the uh, several questions I would ask when I was visiting the farm or talking to the dairy owner or their nutritionist or herdsman, whoever, whoever's in charge at the farm. First of all, really, how many days, if you do have a close-up pen or group, how many days do we actually really spend in the, um, in the, uh, in the close-up pen? And the minimum is 14. The minimum is 14 because we are going to adjust the diet. We are going to adjust the nutrient concentration. The animal has to get used to it. Uh, she's now moving into another group. That may take several days for the social adjustments as well. So we'd like to say 14 is minimum, 21 is optimal there as far as length in the close-up dry period. There's some really useful you know, data that if you go to the module, you see from the University of California when they looked at uh, below 10 days and over 10 days had a significant impact, impact on performance on those cows. Then the next question I would ask is the same one I'm going to ask in the, the, the far off. And that is, well, how much dry matter are these cows actually eating? Uh, they may drop down one kilogram. That would be ideally the maximum I would expect to see. But hopefully they're going to be somewhere around 10 to 12 kilograms of the close-up ration that they'll be consuming there. I like to see those higher numbers because usually that means after calving, if the cow is eating uh, 12 or 13 kilograms, that's where she starts after calving rather than at starting at say 9, 10, or 11, for example. Number three, what adjustments did you make in the close-up ration? Here's another unique ration for these cows. And so hopefully we will be looking at 1,200 plus uh, grams of metabolizable protein. Now, I think that's a, a powerful number. Some farmers are going even a little stronger than that, up to 1,250 to 1,300 grams. That gets fairly expensive. I will add some extra starch into the diet and maybe reduce down to some of the straw to make sure we maintain adequate intake, but I want to get the energy density up a little bit in the diet to allow the rumen microbes to adjust to that higher levels of starch and also meet the extra nutrient requirements. Remember, uh, during this last 21 days, 
uh, these this calf or calves, if they're twins, are rapidly growing, therefore really requiring a much higher nutrient demand from those calves, almost going to synthesize colostrum. And of course, the mammary gland itself undergoes regeneration. And, and so uh, as my dad, bless his soul, would say they, these cows are bagging up. So they have more secretory tissue. Certainly all these uh, physiological changes are requiring nutrients as well. Of course, uh, I'll continue with my organic trace minerals, uh, zinc, copper, chromium. I would definitely be feeding chromium. I, I think the data is strong enough, even though the new NRC did not come out. With a chromium requirement, I, I think it's, it's pretty clear that our, our transition cows respond very nicely to it. I would also be looking at uh, the rumen protected uh, 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 choline uh, to my cows in the, the last 21 days, uh, realizing that's a fairly expensive feed added. But remember, you're only going to feed it for 21 days in or 14 or 16 or many days she's in that pen. And, the, and again, that uh, tends to stimulate dry matter intake and the performance after calving reduces some of the risk of fatty liver development. And it's a starch, about three to four percentage units. So uh, probably uh, the far off dry cow program might be running around 13 or 14 percent starch. This will be around 17 or 18 percent starch. The extra protein, a little bit less uh, uh, forage and required. Perhaps you need to back that down just a little bit there for a fill factor to try to keep that 12 kilograms of dry matter intake. Another thing I'm going to do is, is calculate the DCAD in the ration, the dietary cation uh, difference uh, in the herd, and get that negative. So I'm going to be using one of the products or a calcium binder to tie up some of the calcium to try to be sure I avoid hypocalcemia and a potential risk of milk fever in those herds. And uh, the urine pHs will be somewhere around six to six and a half. That's where you want to be on those programs. And then finally, <clears throat> just look at the calving area. It does have adequate space for cow comfort, for ease of getting up and down, uh, the ability to help a cow or heifer if she needs help getting the calf delivered as far as that goes. And in some cases, um, these cows may be put into what they call a just-in-time calving area, meaning they're moved. Once you see the feet coming out of the, uh, uh, of, of the cow's uh, uh, reproductive tract, then they move them into a specific pen uh, for a couple hours to be sure they can really monitor uh, the calf delivery and speed and, and see if there's any complications as well. So those are our two case studies for today. Hopefully they were helpful for you. Uh, that would be case study 21, uh, ch challenges or considerations for far off dry cow program, case study 22, which is close up dry cow. And you can always expect in February, you can, you know, what's coming next. One of the case studies will be the fresh cow program as well. So uh, that will take care of that phase of it. Um, are there any questions that uh, may pop up here? Uh, just say that at this point, that part two of today's program. So I'll just give you a, a minute here and see if anything comes up. And uh, um, uh, sir, what is the reason for pica? Uh, pica, let me define pica as I understand it. Uh, quasi, and, and that is uh, animals chewing on uh, wood or dirt or uh, fencing or something like that, uh, just kind of a gnawing experience. And if that's your definition of pica, then uh, the research would suggest uh, boredom is probably one of the big reasons uh, the animal just needs to do chew on something. They want to chew on something. Uh, second one might be that they're a little bit short on effective fiber in the feeding program. So uh, the, the innate ability to want to, uh, to, to ruminate and to cut chew. Uh, when we did studies at the University of Wisconsin on milk fat depression diets, uh, we had one cow that actually had a box, a wooden box around her, and she ate a large piece of lumber. Uh, we would call that a two by four. Uh, some of you, that's the dimension of the wood. And she just chewed that down in half as far as that goes. And these cows, if they were turned out at, at, at uh, in the exercise lot, they would go over to the manure area and actually eat the manure. Uh, they were really craving fiber, really craving fiber. There has been some suggestion that it could be a mineral deficiency relationship, especially if they're eating dirt. And yet uh, I cannot find any research that would back that up uh, at this point. But uh, figures will point it towards phosphorus because they would see cows gnawing on like uh, uh, skeletal remains that may be out in a pasture area. 
or you know in a range condition, especially with beef cattle, as far as that goes. So if you, if you if you this uh, this this, uh, this pica as I define it happening, just double check your your minerals and uh, and um, and fiber levels. Uh, he indicates uh, basically these animals are are licking hair uh, and sand. Um, hair is a bit unusual. That could be a grooming response. That's very common. In fact, you'll see in some of our modern dairy farms here in the U.S., they now put in the uh, automated brushes so cows can groom. So that's that's pretty clear. The sand one is not uncommon, especially if, if it's uh, fresh sand. Sometimes when you would uh, put sand in free stalls, cows will eat uh, significant amounts of sand. That's bad news because that sand just sits down the bottom of the rumen. And that just basically um, puts more distension in the room and also takes up some space as far as that goes as well. We always had a University of Illinois and we would go in uh, same cow because she was very, very tame for lack of a better word and very old. And uh, we would go in her room in every, uh, every semester and come out with uh, one or two handfuls of soil, which is probably coming from, uh, from uh, the forages that they were consuming as far as that goes. They also had a dirt lot, so they could have consumed that as well. So that would be my answer on that one. Uh, seeing no other questions popping up here, let's move on to phase two of our today's program. And so I am going to go to a PowerPoint. Hopefully it'll, it's going to come up for us. And here it is. And we'll go into the show mode so you can see it even bigger. And so we decided, uh, or I should say, I decided, talking with the folks from Santa Fe, that we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the, the a feeding guide. And some of you probably have heard about this, but if you haven't, I, I think it's something, if you are really into dairy nutrition, you may want to consider accessing here uh, to uh, for information. So we'll, to walk it through here, uh, this is the actual cover of the book, uh, Feeding Guide, 4th Edition, Hordes Dairyman. And we'll walk you through that, give you a little history about it, and then what's in it, and then what the cost is going to be, and how you can purchase that uh, product as well. So uh, it's a feeding guide, and uh, just to be upfront with you, being as we'd say here in politics, transparent, uh, I'm the author of the book. So uh, here is what is in the Horse Dairyman booklet. It's 103 pages long. It has lots of il illustrative pictures and tables and figures that you can use as well. So it's written in a very uh, in an applied format. In fact, we used this booklet as my textbook in class. Uh, you'll see what it all covers. Uh, and we've used this as a textbook in our U.S. Uh, initiative, uh, Dairy Teaching Consortium, that occurs down in the New Mexico, Texas area every summer here that we'll have uh, 25, 30 students taking the class. It consists of 14 chapters. You'll see what they are here. It includes seven appendix tables, and I'll show you what those appendix tables are, uh, what the titles are at least. There are numerous sidebars, and we'll go through those very quickly. And just so you're clear about it, uh, it's been I'm the uh, author, um, the be honest, the only author of the booklet itself, but it's been reviewed by uh, several people at Hordes as well. You might wonder, Hordes Dairyman is one of our major dairy magazines. In fact, uh, my understanding is that it's now going to be translated into Portuguese for those uh, for those individuals that uh, are not wanting to speak or cannot speak English easily. It'll be in Portuguese here in the near future as well. Back in the 1920s, uh, the, the magazine, Hordes Dairyman, uh, they have a book section, by the way, and that's where these books are sold. Uh, they have a number of books. They have a great one on fertility and calf raising and hoof care. It's a, it's a wonderful reference there. They're all written at a very applied level. Initially, the first one was in the 1920s, and it was a feeding guide that included uh, dairy cattle, uh, chickens and poultry, horses, because that was a major source of power on farms and also swine. Uh, many farms here in the Midwest, uh, that was what we call a diversified farm. And they had milk cows and all these other species and, and raised all these things for some cases for, for personal use and other cases for sales off the farm to generate income. Some of you older people, I won't ask a show of hands here or at this point, but uh, the initial one was written by Dr. Marsh McCulloch, 
a really talented gentleman from the University of Florida, from the University of Georgia. And then Dr. Jim Crowley, after he passed away, Dr. Jim Crowley, University of Wisconsin took it over. In fact, Dr. Crowley was one of my mentors. He was just a great, great uh, assistant for me when I was in college and also when I started my first job at the University of Minnesota. Unfortunately, he passed away as well. And so in 1998, I uh, took it over and actually modeled it a bit after the four state dairy feeding guide that was put together by a group of us in the four states of Iowa, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Illinois. And that was the first edition. Uh, I was only the senior author, but we did cite that many times in the book. The second edition then occurred uh, five years later, you can see, and then another edition, third edition was in 2008, it was the third one. Those all had new updates, new information, new concepts. Uh, in fact, I think if I went back to the 1998 one, one of the real new topics would have been um, uh, high moisture corn. It was a, a relatively new feed at that point. Uh, in fact, uh, back in 1998, a corn silage was not considered much of a dairy forage. It was considered more for, for beef cattle and steers as far as that goes. Then the fourth edition came out in 2018. It should have came out a year, a year or two earlier, but we were thinking the new NRC was going to be out and we wanted to include that. And finally, we couldn't wait any longer. They ran out of copies. We had new information there. We had a pretty good idea where the NRC was going to go. And so that is the current publication that you just saw. And uh, we'll just we'll just back that up. Uh, that's this one right here. You'll see it says the fourth edition listed there as well. Uh, it has some very worldwide applications. Uh, I've been very pleased with it. It has been translated into the following languages as Spanish, uh, Japanese, Italian, French, Russian, Chinese, and now it's just been translated into Portuguese, and that's the, the, trans, that the translation was led by the technical group from Santa Fe Institute, and so it's, it's, it's kind of around the world. Uh, the good news is that the Portuguese edition will be the fourth edition. I'm pretty sure the other ones are the third edition. I, I don't know if they uh, <clears throat> translated the, the newest version or not at this point. Here are your chapters you can look at, and uh, the page numbers are, are just cut off there, but you can look at that at your leisure, and we're going to come through these very quickly here in the next uh, 20 minutes to give you a little idea of what, what's in the book and, and if, if it's something that you may want to add to your, to your library as well. So here we go. Chapter one is on rumen physiology. Uh, it talks a bit about the anatomy, the size, uh, the development of the rumen itself. Uh, the part that's probably the most useful is going to be a, a rumen fermentation of carbohydrates, uh, the beauty of that, of course, it has uh, how the different sources of volatile fatty acids are produced, what are the substrates, and which microbial groups attack those carbohydrates. What do you mean by carbohydrates? Sugars, starches, NDFs would be examples. So a uh, nice table, I think that's table uh, uh, table 1.1. Uh, there's also a, a nice table on uh, protein and nitrogen metabolism. And there it discusses uh, the various protein fractions. Now, some of you will have heard about these, the A1, <clears throat> excuse me, the A fraction, the B1, the B2, the B3, and C. So uh, protein is, is a much more complex when you feed it to dairy cattle than when you feed it, say, to poultry or swine, as far as that goes. And it gives you some really nice guidelines on that one as well. It also has a nice discussion on uh, uh, fats, minerals, and vitamins, what their impacts are going to be in the rumen fermentation. And then, of course, there's a, a nice discussion on something that's very important to all dairy farmers, and that is rumen pH, uh, the scale, how it's calculated, and then something called SERA, which stands for subacute rumen acidosis. So uh, there's a nice section on that as well. And I think there's six or seven factors that contribute to, to SERA that you can look at and you may see on various farms from time to time as well. So hopefully this may be about as technical of a chapter as any of them, and yet you'll see it's pretty applied to explain what's going on in the rumen and how you can change it, what type of VFAs, what kind of nitrogen sources you need, and how to avoid rumen acidosis in the feeding program. So that's chapter number one. Chapter number two is, is kind of boring, I guess. These are feed nutrients. Uh, we go through them, and uh, there you see they're all listed. We do consider water as a uh, as a nutrient, and listed in there is uh, water tables to tell you how many uh, liters of water. And by the way, all the measurements in the book are in both metric and British. 
or sterling, however you want to call that. In other words, water will be both in liters and also in quarts or gallons. Uh, carbohydrates will be, for example, in grams, kilograms, or pounds, as far as that goes. So the water, we're working from the bottom on up on water. Uh, it'll tell you how much water cows should drink based on their uh, lactation stage, dry cows, milk cows, how much milk they give, and under heat stress. Nice, nice table to have. There's a nice equation in there. You can actually calculate it if you wish. And then other, the risk factors, meaning what, what could be in the water that causes problems, nitrates, nitrites, iron, uh, hardness of the water, uh, sulfur, those are all listed there as, as well. And what are considered actual points based on work out of Minnesota and Michigan State. So that's the water section. Let's go back to the top one. Carbohydrates, we'll talk about uh, the different types, barleys, corns, wheats, for example, and then the, the, the processing effects as well. In fact, in the book, I think it's in a different chapter, though, uh, it'll tell you what's what do you mean by, by rolling, by steam flaking, by crimping, by popping, by um, microwaving, uh, by grinding. It goes through it a, a nice definition of what those processes are and how it impacts the starch availability in the feeding program. And we'll get the fats and oils, uh, pretty straightforward. We're looking at different sources of uh, fats and oils in the diet. And then there's a short discuss discussion on PUFA, which, of course, stands for polyunsaturated fatty acids and gives us some guidelines on how many grams of that fat should be in the trash and dry matter. That includes coming from corn, corn grain, and any added supplements you may have. Uh, protein talks about amino acids and and um, d different routes and it has a nice drawing. It'll trace show you where basically 400 and uh, uh, 454 grams of nitrogen, not protein, but nitrogen goes once the cow consumes it. Where does it go? Uh, where, uh, in the rumen, when it gets to the liver, when it goes to the mammary gland, when it goes to the kidney and how it traces around. It actually has, this is some data from the University of Wisconsin that actually shows you the grams that goes to those different point, uh, spots as well. And on vitamins, uh, we're looking pretty much again uh, on, on uh, minerals and vitamins. We list, list uh, four important factors. Uh, first one, what is the function of that mineral vitamin? Number two, what's the deficiency signs of it? Uh, number three, uh, what is the recommended um, uh, relationships uh, to other minerals? For example, uh, zinc to copper would be one example. Uh, sodium, potassium is another relationship out there as well. And then we end up with uh, sources. What are common sources that you would consider if you're short on zinc, if you're short on copper, if you're short on potassium, they're listed there as well. So those are big tables. So it's, a, so it's not a lot of words. It's a table. Very easy reading and fast reading as far as that goes. So that's chapter number two. Let's move on. Chapter number three. Pretty straightforward. Uh, this is probably the most important one. You'll find this one probably the most valuable one. And that's uh, dry matter intake, um, how to predict it. There are a couple of tables in there that actually tell you how much dry matter they may take. They will not have the new NRC tables in there. We're looking at ways of trying to get that into the book uh, with hordes. Uh, I don't think we're going to redo the book. Uh, maybe it just be an add-on or a slip-in page that shows the new dry matter intakes there. Uh, what is What determines for is dry matter intake? Uh, what we call the 13 pound or six kilogram rule. Uh, this is the maintenance of dry matter needed every day for a Holstein cow to stay alive before she produces milk or gets pregnant or grows or anything like that. And then there's that nice discussion on feed efficiency there uh, that uh, can be done. You have a whole module, however, in the class. So if you want to know more about feed efficiency, uh, you're just going to be touched on in the book compared to if you go to the class. And that's the beauty. Uh, just about every one of our classes have one or two or three modules that relate to one of these new these chapters as well. So that is chapter number three. What's in chapter th number three? A really nice table, big, nice figure showing uh, how these uh, play uh, play out. In fact, that is in chapter number four. This is what we call the gestation slash lactation curve. I see that slash to put in there, but it's, it's a it's a. I think you'll find this one a very powerful chapter as well, because we look at four factors that impact cows in the dry period and when they're lactating. And that is the milk curve. Of course, there is no milk curve in dry cows. The dry matter dry matter intake curve, the impact of milk components in that curve, and then body weight loss as well. And this is based on some data that came from Dr. Randy Shaver at the University of Wisconsin. So there's some really hard data. 
on there that really shows the importance of those four curves. Then we take those four curves and superimpose them into what we call our phase feeding. And so, uh, in fact, we just talked in our case study about far off dry cows. Uh, some of that information would be found in that in that uh, phase feeding uh, section of the book. Uh, phase two is close up dry cows. So, the far off dry cows is basically from the day she's dried off to about four uh, to about 21 days prepartum or before calving. Close up dry cows are going to be basically 21 days before calving up to the day of calving. Fresh cows will be, of course, those cows that are uh, in a from zero to 21 days after calving. Early lactation cows will be those cows that are 21 days after calving all the way up to probably 150 to 155 days, 160 days. Mid lactation cows would be, uh, would be after 150 days, probably to about 100, 200, uh, 210, 220. And late lactation cows, and some are really good herds in Illinois, there is no late lactation cows. Uh, they are still considered mid-lactation cows based on the amount of milk they're producing and the dry matter they're consuming and their body condition score. So in a perfect world, this would be your answer. How many diets would you have on a farm? And in a perfect world with lots of cows and lots of pens and lots of labor, you'd be looking at six different rations you'd feed to these cows. And of course, that feeds right into a very important topic that will be covered in the future, and that is precision feeding. We'll talk more about that. And we may be developing a module on that here in the next month or two to, to load up onto your website as well. So that's chapter number four. So chapter three and four really got some great basic on-farm hands-on things to think about. Chapter number five gets a little bit more uh, um, straightforward for a nutrition class. We talk about the different kinds of forages, and there's a paragraph on every one of them. Uh, there, uh, your legumes, your grasses, your different grasses, uh, grains, the same thing, the corn, barley, wheat, uh, for grain sources, protein supplement, a short description on uh, the uh, uh, soy, canola, uh, soybeans itself, uh, distillers, grains, some of those as well. Uh, the nutrient profile of all these feeds are in the big tables. You'll see that here in just a few minutes as well. And then there is a very four pages that we call feed additives. And this lists 26 different feed additives. Believe it or not, guys and gals, there are 26 different feed additives. Now, some of these would be considered uh, trace minerals uh, or organic minerals, but anyway, 26 of them. And they're broken down into such things as how do they function? feed additive. What level should you feed? What does it cost in Illinois? What's the benefit to cost ratio? What's the payback? What is the strategy of when would you feed it? And then finally, what's the, the recommended status? Yes, you should feed it. Uh, basically, uh, you're on your own. Uh, more research is needed or no, I wouldn't recommend it. So that's chapter number five. Chapter number six, our feeding systems. Again, this will be of interest to some people who have limited background uh, on it, but it goes through all these different feeding uh, forage systems, including uh, pasture, green chop, uh, baleage, haylage, uh, and of course, uh, silage is stored in piles, bunkers, and upright silos. So silages itself are in there as well. And just some, some guidelines on that. Uh, and then another section in chapter six is the grain systems. Talking about total mixed ration, which is probably most common in the U.S. now. I think about 70, 75% of our farmers feed total mixed ration. Individual uh, parlor feeding in, in milking parlors, uh, or excuse me, I'll get it right. Individually, is be cows that are in stanchion barns that are top dressed, usually herds under, under 100 cows. Uh, parlor feeding in the milking parlor, very uncommon. We don't see that hardly any, I don't know of any farm in Illinois that's doing that now. Then you got the electronic grain feeders and, of course, your robotic feeders would fit into that category very nicely there, or you can have a standalone grain feeder as well. And then we'll talk about mineral systems, uh, force-fed, free choice, uh, water systems, things like that in the uh, in, in chapter number six. Okay, uh, also in chapter number six are some so uh, storage costs, some older data from the University of Wisconsin looking at the in initial cost, for example, to build a bunker and then what is the annual cost to uh, store feed in that on a dry matter basis? So again, a, a nice table. It's got a little age on it, but uh, nobody else has put out newer information. I keep looking for it and we don't see it. Chapter number seven is, is uh, pretty straightforward, just about what the title says, a ra ra ration uh, formulation. And uh, as the title indicates, it, it's pretty, uh, pretty straight, 
in terms of how to hand calculate a ration. We make all our students in class do a ration by hand because then they know where the numbers come from. Uh, I think uh, someone who doesn't understand where numbers come from is a dangerous nutritionist. And he or she can very quickly get the wrong numbers in the wrong places and you end up getting a ration that is not a very logical or correct ration out there in the feeding program. Another thing it walks you through very carefully is the Pearson square or the square method of determining any nutrient in a ration. And of course that goes in with the hand calculated rations. And then a short discussion on uh, software analysis. There are different kinds of software analysis. Some are models, some are least cost, some are best cost. And then there are examples of a Spartan three ration from Michigan State, a one uh, there, and then a, a sample of the NRC 2001 ration, which uh, was was available. Uh, the ration, the new model just came out two weeks ago, and uh, I have not had a chance to work with it yet because I'm boxed out of it. My university controls what programs can be put on the system, and they have no, they have uh, no. Uh, uh, I have to get special uh, permission to load it onto my, my uh, computer at home or in the office as far as that goes. But it just simply shows you the, the power of uh, two models. Both of them, by the way, are modeling programs. Uh, the Spartan, you, uh, you can get a 60-day uh, 60, uh, 60 free trial. Uh, Dairy Ration 201 probably is not available anymore, but the new one is free. So you can just download the new one. It's free of charge, and it runs identically. Any of you online that have used the NRC 2001 model, it'll look, it'll look in terms of functionality just almost identical. But, of course, all the new equations are in there. They've added some economic values, some environmental uh, measurements as well, which uh, fatty acid profiles are some really neat stuff in, in the new one as well. So that's ration formulation. And, of course, many of you, that's your job. Uh, you work with farmers or your herdsmen or you own a farm and you are actually doing that as well out there in the program. We then go to chapter number eight. Uh, this is kind of a fun one uh, because most people don't think much about this. And that is, well, how do I determine what I price hay? Or how do I price hay when it's standing in the field or silages? And how do we price it out? And so we got a couple of different ways ways of doing that using relative feed value, RQ, relative quality indexes. You can ca calculate it out that way. Pricing corn silage, there is uh, two methods listed in the book. Uh, the most common one is 10 times the price of a bushel of corn in your area at the time of harvest, but uh, there's another way that you can actually back into that. Uh, pricing byproduct feeds, and it talks a little bit about uh, sesame and uh, feed valve. These are two software programs that you can use to actually uh, calculate the value of the nutrients in the feed. Uh, these programs have uh, no cow sense. In other words, uh, they don't know, uh, you know, uh, you have to feed forages. They don't know you have to feed long, uh, long, long stemmed uh, or lo long forages to maintain rumen health. They just look at what is in the feed stuff, compare that to all the other reference feeds in the library that you list that you select there. And then pricing commercial concentrates gets to be another one. Uh, that would be such things as some of your protein supplements and your grain supplements. So it's an interesting chapter. Uh, I'm not sure if I were going to read uh, only four chapters. This would be one of the first four I would read, but it's there for your for your reading pleasure. We then go to chapter number nine, and and the, the, this is a it was a challenging one to pull together. Uh, these are all the orders that dairy cattle, dairy calves, dairy heifers, dry cows, milk cows can run into. And there is a short uh, description on each of these. Uh, wow, the occurrence, you know, like 2%, 10%, 30% occurrence. What, what, what is it? Well, what is grass tetany? What, what would be the signs of hemorrhagic bowel, for example? And then how do you prevent it? What are some of the nutrition or management factors that you would look at to try to prevent milk fever, moldy feed, urea toxicity, utter edema, things like that? So uh, it's a pretty big list. I, I think most readers that buy the book are surprised to see them. And I must admit, I looked down the list here and I've not seen prussic acid toxicity. I have seen ergot, by the way. I've not seen urea toxicity of the, of the two on the list here. I have not seen grass tetany uh, on farms that I visited as well. And uh, I've not seen nitrate poisoning, but all the rest I have actually physically seen farmers that were challenged or farms that had challenges from these feeding disorders. Uh, they are called disorders. They're not diseases. Diseases means there's an organism. Mastitis, for example, has an organism, staph or strep. 
that causes it, you know, or calf scours may have, uh, um, uh, you know, E. coli or something like that. These are all due to something in the feed that was uh, damaged with the feed, stored improperly, uh, or fed to a too high a level or, or, or not balanced correctly. So there you are, chapter nine. I think this one of the really fun ones. A lot of people love to read chapter nine just to get a background in case they see it out there in the field. Uh, we do have a chapter on calf feeding guidelines, and for many people, this is one of their favorite chapters. And you can see all the items listed here that you have uh, on, um, on calf feeding, looking at different choices. Colostrum management comes into place here. Uh, starter considerations, water intake. Water becomes critical because calves have to have access to water to encourage starter intake. The use of electrolytes, uh, tremendous therapy for animals that are showing signs of dehydration. What about feeding forages to calves? A nice uh, a recommendation there uh, based on some work coming out of Spain. And then there are some feed additives that we'd have, especially control of coccidiosis, and a nice discussion on that one as well. So that's chapter number 10. Chapter number 11 is, uh, again, just what you'd expect to see here. Uh, these are your heifers basically at once they come off of calf starter uh, and going, getting ready to enter the milking herd. So one of the big questions is how many groups you have to have. And you'll see in a perfect world that seven would be the right number. Uh, but you can read that in the book as far as that goes. All the requirement tables for 2001 NRC are listed there just as they were published as far as that goes. There are new tables that come out in 2021. And uh, that is contained in the big book that I just also got 10 days ago as well. And uh, we will... Uh, plan to get those added to uh, this, this booklet uh, over time. Uh, then looking at growth patterns, uh, body condition scores. Uh, then there's a section on late, <clears throat> late pregnant heifers. I notice I don't call them dry cows. These are late pregnant heifers. They are different than dry cows. And one of the big differences, of course, is that uh, they've never had a calf before. Therefore, they have to develop the mammary system uh, uh, basically from rudimentary aspects here. And they're still growing. Most of these calves uh, these heifers should be growing 700 grams a day in that uh, in that uh, a pregnant pen, as far as that goes. And then a short discussion on contract raising heifers. Uh, some of our farmers will uh, send their heifers off to an alternate uh, growing site to be raised once they've got their colostrum. In some cases, it'd be after they've been weaned. In some cases, when they're four or five months of age. In some cases, after they're pregnant. So there, there's all different kinds of timing on contract heifers. <clears throat> and of course, the associated costs, there's a heifer budget in there as well. Chapter number 12, we better keep going. We we'll have no time for questions. Uh, managing uh, transition cows, and it would help if Mike would spell managing correctly. My apologies on that one. I just saw that now. I didn't see that when I was practicing. So we'll look at the, uh, the dry cow stages we talked about earlier, uh, a big discussion on low energy rations, uh, the guidelines for Dr. Jim Drakely. Some of you recognize that name, what his guidelines are for these low energy dry cow rations. A discussion on how to calculate a DCAD and the various products that are out there that you can consider using in the feeding program. So certainly that is chapter number uh, 12. We go to chapter number 13. We call this the special feeding challenges. Uh, we have four of them listed there. If you would go back to the previous edition, editions uh, three, there was a section on uh, Bo uh, BST because it was still legal back when we uh, developed that book back there in, uh, in 2008. Of course, it's no longer allowed here in the U.S. BST. It's still legal but mo almost all milk processing companies will not purchase the milk. Of course, that's, that's a bit of a problem if you're a dairy farmer, if, uh, if your mil milk processing plants won't buy the milk. So here are the four ones that are laid out there. Uh, this is a very dynamic one, robotic milking systems. Uh, this is one that probably should need to be slightly revised because when we did this in 2008, uh, 2018, these systems were just coming in, and now we've got some another four or five years of experience with these as well. Uh, section on milking uh, herds three times a day, things to be considered, things to watch out for, uh, factors like that. Uh, section on heat stress, uh, it's a very popular one. Heat stress appears to continue to be a bigger and bigger concern. We had huge problems with heat stress and drought in the western parts of the United States and even here in Illinois. We had moisture, but of course it was still pretty hot. So heat stress continues to seem to be an increasing problem on dairy farms. And then we decided to put a section on, on hoof health and looking at uh, such things as management, uh, trimming times, uh, foot baths, and, and then of course feeding. 
There's about four or five feeding factors that come into play. Zinc, for example, um, uh, uh, biotin would be another one to come to uh, come into my, come to mind. Uh, protein levels, arch, those kind of things come into play as well. So those are the special chapters. Chapter number 14 uh, looks at, um, at that time, this would have been in uh, uh, 2018, kind of what were the, the, the new things in the NRC. And uh, of course, there are new things now in 2021. We, we couldn't write that chapter because we didn't have the book until about 10 days ago. And uh, there's some major modifications in terms of uh, amino acids and approaches. Uh, they have, they've scrapped the first limiting amino acid. The metabolizable protein is still there. And, and that's a magic, that's going to be a magic term. I don't think they may change a title and name from time to time. But by, the line, by and large, that is, that is magic. Uh, energy changes, uh, no longer uh, non-fiber carbohydrate, NFC, it's gone. And now we got organic matter, or rumen organic matter comes taking its place. And uh, Dr. Bill Weiss and uh, Rich Erdman, they made doctors, uh, Rich Erdman and Bill Weiss, made some mineral changes out there, changes in dry matter intakes. Are, there's some pretty unique things. And of course, we talked about some of that already in the class here. And we hope in the next several months, we'll come back and visit some of those areas again, a little more depth. Now that we have the book, we have the tables, we can probably be a bit more targeted, we come with that aspect as well. Here are your appendix tables, and they're exactly what you think they are. Very boring, but very necessary. So it, it lists uh, uh, tables two and three are very helpful, depending on what breed you have, or if you have crossbreeding that's going on out there on your farm. So that gives you ideas of what the, the nutrient guidelines would be. For example, levels of metabolizable protein, uh, levels of uh, starch, uh, levels of NF and NDF. And these are fairly specific. You'll see at those tables, it says adapted from. And the reason we say adapted from is because the, the old NRC eh, had no starch guidelines at all. They didn't even talk about it as far as that goes. And yet our farmers were asking nutritionists and consultants were saying, well, well, what should the level of starch be in rations? Well, typically 25, 26, 27% starch, depending on sources and the rest of the diet, for example. Same thing applies to Jersey. So um, and now the new NRC, uh, just to give you a clue, when they say starch recommendations for cows at different uh, levels of milk production, they'll say they'll give you a range from, uh, I think it's like uh, 19 to 19 to 30 or 19 to 28. Uh, that doesn't help you and I very much. Uh, we need, and that same is for a cow giving uh, 50 liters of milk or giving 40 or giving 30 liters of milk. That same range is there listed in their table in the book. Ah, enough said. Table number four is a uh, level of uh, nutrients and forages. So it lists, uh, you know, ADF, NDF, crude protein, uh, calcium, phosphorus, uh, oils, uh, those kind of numbers as well. Same thing in table five, energy feeds. That would include your, your corns, uh, your barleys, your wheats, those kinds of feeds as well. And then uh, some of the byproduct feeds fall in that category. And then, of course, the protein concentrates. That would be your soy, your canola, your distiller's grains, uh, those kinds of feeds as well. And then table number seven is a nutrient requirement table. And <laughs> the bad news, I went through the book. Now I've read it, um, I read it once and reviewed it a couple of times. There is no requirement table. <laughs> in other words, you, you're just going to have to run the program. Uh, th there are guidelines, but as far as requirements for maintenance, requirements for growth, uh, they do have it for heifers. There is some requirement tables for heifers, but for cows, you almost got to use the model. Okay, let's finish up here. Side boxes. What are side boxes? Well, side boxes literally are, are uh, <clears throat> topics that uh, we want to go into more in depth that would stand out. So here they are. And I'm not going to read them to you. Uh, I think one that I find, find useful is a Penn State particle size box. The proof of guideline, how many grams per day there. I like mineral ratios, uh, not addressed in the new NRC, but I think very helpful. Uh, certainly drenching, some guidelines on drenching cows. Uh, a section on kernel processing and on low lignin alfalfa, lower lignin alfalfa. So these are just side box areas. And also, and, and for some of you, the boxes are really the most, con the most useful things to look at. Uh, for example, what are conjugated linoleic acid, which are the good ones, which are the bad bad ones? How do you process soybeans if you're going to feed that to dairy cows? Microtoxin guidelines. You've got microtoxins. What about that UNDF or should uh, value? So what, what, what? how do we use that as well? And how do you calculate and how do we use RFQ for relative forage quality, uh, relative forage quality index? 
So those are all the side boxes as well. So let's wrap up. And we've got a few little time here ordering. How would you get the uh, uh, the feeding guide? Uh, well, if you're if you have uh, um, if you want it in Portuguese, the bottom one, there's a link to uh, that website, and that's where you can actually buy the Portuguese version. I was told earlier today that uh, they've sold over uh, 180 copies of this version, so it's everything you just saw, but it's all in Portuguese and uh, done by a very skilled uh, transition team as far as that goes. For those of you that do not speak Portuguese, you have two choices. You can get the hard uh, paper copy, and I'm going to hold that book up for you. You can actually see it here in just a minute once we get off of the, the PowerPoint here. You just have to Google Hordes and Dairyman Magazine. Go to their, their book section that's listed there on the website, and the cost of that is $25 plus shipping. So uh, that's pretty cheap. Our students are really pleased to see they don't have to pay $100 for a textbook in my class. And it's not required, but it really helps my students that have limited farm backgrounds and don't understand some of, the, some of the, the, the terminology, if you wish. The one that I think many of you should think about is what I call, or I, it's called the electronic copy. And that's basically an I, uh, uh, you, you, you'll, you'll get it, uh, it's an ebook or an iBook. And so you'll go, you'll need to get to the, that app. And so the way I found it was, or my son, I should say, Charles, he searched Hordes Dairyman. And then he selected in the box, selection box feed guide and up she comes, up she comes. And you notice that $11.99. So it's half the price of the paper book. And now you don't have to worry about shipping because it's electronically accessed to it. And... Um, the another way you could do that, he showed me both of them. You could Google Hordes Dairyman Feeding Guide, and up it comes. And, and you can click on the link, and uh, there it is. Not only do you get the book when you buy the electronic copy, you also get five or six videos because you can do that in, in an ebook or an iBook showing you how to wash manure, how to use the Penn State box. Um, uh, how to uh, do uh, manure particle sizing with uh, the Cargill unit. So um, that, that's almost a bonus. It's half the price. And let me tell you, shipping a book at $25 will probably cost you that much in shipping and hand, handling to get the book. And it may take several months to get there. In fact, we, uh, we used to do our online classes and we finally get gave up sending out CDs. We just literally went on a website and, uh, and out it went. So there we go. I uh, hope some of you may want to look at that. If you've got an interest, I think you'll find it extremely applied and very informative. And so with that, I am going to uh, uh, minimize this and I should be coming up here on, and there I am. And you can see me, hopefully. Uh, I'm going to hold up the book. Here it is. Uh, it's, uh, you'll see it's got all kinds of papers in it because that's where I find a lot of my answers. That some of your questions that you folks raised for me as well. And of course, you can see, I, I just hold it up and you can see here's uh, one of the chapters illustrated with a very nice photo and shows you how it works. Okay, so that takes care of part number two. That took a little longer than I was going to. I want to answer though before any questions may come in here. I do want to answer a question from last, from December. Uh, one of you asked a bit about Brewers NDF and distillers, NDF levels in feedstuffs, I've got it for you. So uh, those are two potentially wet feed ingredients that may be available in your country, uh, depending on your processing and manufacturing areas there. Uh, brewer's grains contain 46% uh, NDF. That should be a fairly digestible NDF because uh, depending because of the base grains. Uh, DDGs, dry distillers grains, they'd be 44% NDF. And that is a very digestible NDF, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> because that contains the outside hull area from the, the, the corn grain itself and, and is the basis of corn gluten meal, excuse me, corn gluten feed. So very, very digestible as far as that goes. In terms of uh, that, so that's the NDF value oil. They're almost identical. Um, uh, generally speaking, oil in, in, in brewer's grain, a six and a half percent oil on a dry matter base. By the way, the ADF, excuse me, the NDF is on a dry matter base, and uh, distilled grains can vary, be anywhere from six to 14, depending on how much oil has been extracted at the plant that's producing uh, the, the ethanol. So uh, they'll suck off some of that oil 
that's a real plus for us for swine and for dairy but a real negative for beef cattle because it really drops energy content down a great deal and because of the high oil content uh, and higher fiber digestibilities ddgs or distillers grains will be higher in energy content than brewers grains so there's the answer to that question hopefully that person who asked that question is online or we'll listen to the program a bit later so with that i'll open it up and we've got questions uh, coming in and uh, we'll take those questions first. Uh, go to our, our website uh, with Santa Fe because I answered uh, three more questions last night and Kelly, my coworker there, she'll post those in the next several days and that you can see them. And there's also another seven there. So uh, since uh, our last time, uh, there's been about 10 questions that have came in through Santa Fe that is sent to me and I answer those directly to Santa Fe and they answer, they post that on the website. That's where you'll find your answers. So uh, Quasi says, what should the pH urine on a DCAD diet be? Well, that's a good question. Uh, two answers. Uh, if you're looking at a modified acidified diet, which means you're not going to go a really low level, that your diet goes. Um, it range there uh, somewhere between six and seven. Uh, the research would suggest once you get around seven, you lose the benefits of the, the DCAD product in terms of maintaining higher blood calcium levels. If you go fully acidified, which means you're going to go to a higher level of a different product, then your urine pH is going to be around 5.5 to 6. And that gives you a bit more wiggle room that if something changes in your forage in terms of, uh, of potassium or sodium or chlorine levels, that gives you a little more of a chance before the cows tell you something has changed. What do you mean cows tell you? Well, you see more cases of, uh, of uh, hypocalcemia that's occurring in those animals as well. So it depends on the program. The urine pH is critical. Uh, but that's diagnostic. So it just depends on which program you're on. Somewhere between five and a half to six or six to seven, depending on which program you're on, would be the answer. Thanks. Good question. Wow, we got a long question here from Garrett. Does anyone have any experience of canola meal calling extreme snotty and panting in cows similar to a fog feeder? Wow. Oh, I have no experience with that. Let's be fair with that. So maybe somebody wants to plunk, uh, jump in on this one here. Also, lung damage, as we found on our farm after postmortem examination. And I assume you're referring to the canola meal being causing that. I I question that, Garrett, but um, you're, it's your cows. Uh, who, who am I? And you probably had a vet out there to do it. The issue began after canola introduction and stopped shortly after canola was being removed from my TMR. Any insight greatly appreciated? Well, Garrett, you're going to be surprised. I have no insight at all. Uh, I have not heard that or seen that. Uh, obviously, uh, you did kind of the, the smart thing. You you put it in, you saw some type of negative response to the cows. In this case, it looks like to be kind of a health issue. And you took it out and, and it went away. So I, I'm not going to challenge you on that, but I'm not seeing it. I don't know if anybody else online has. We would certainly welcome uh, your input on that as well. And if I see somebody from the Canola Council, which is up in Canada. Oh, uh, Garrett, I'll, I'll, men I'll mention it uh, to them. In fact, I may just um, let me make a, a not a mental note because mental notes don't work well for me. But I'm going to make a note on a canola and the the panting and the snotty. And that's so I'm just talking as I'm writing here and lung damage. And um, I'll go to Essie Evans. Essie Evans is a Canadian nutritionist, one of the, one of the a really good nutritionists. And she works with a Canadian uh a Canadian Canola Council, and I'll send a note to her and see if she can respond. So at this time, um, Garrett, ig ignorance is bliss. So thanks. If anybody's got some experience, uh, please share with them right now in the next uh, three minutes. Type them on in. Do you have another question that's coming in here? Uh, here, uh, Abadess Alam. What is the disadvantage of using urea? Agriculturally not protected in feeding cows. Um, I want two, 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 two comments. First of all, uh, I'm, I'm a bit nervous. If the urea has to be feed grade, cannot be agricultural or fertilizer grade or industry grade because of contaminant risk. So if you're going to feed urea, it must be feed grade urea so that there is no contaminants that could affect the milk quality or affect the animal herself. Uh, disadvantage urea, there is no disadvantage if you need more soluble protein. 
So certain uh, urea is doubled in price just because of energy costs going around the world. So it's not as cheap as what it was back, say, six months ago. But certainly if you need, uh, the only disadvantage is that the human microbes must capture the urea, which is quickly broken down to ammonia and made into microbial protein. Otherwise, as we jokingly say, you are in the urine business, which means the cow is just going to recycle it and out it goes in, into the urine and it's lost. And, and then, of course, your milk, urine, nitrogens go up because it's coming from the coming from the same source as well. So those would be the two things that uh, have a solemn, that I would be concerned about. Uh, what kind of urea it is, and then do you have the right kind of diet or ration that allows it to be optimized? What kind of ration would you find? High corn silage, baled hay, lower quality grasses, because uh, the urea breaks down to ammonia, and ammonia is pretty clear data, will stimulate fiber digesting bacteria. And in fact, there's some places other protein supplements for that said purpose. Plus, it also makes the supplement a little bit cheaper by, by doing it that well. Very good. We may have time for one more question if we have it here, uh, Dr. Murad. Um, um, uh, here, here's a different one popped up here. What what can cause hypocalcemia in mid-lactation cows? Generally, our, my experience has been primarily calcium av availability. Usually it's in older cows and high-producing cows. They get lots of milk, and we'll see what we call these mid-lactation milk fevers. These, these cows will actually go down with milk fever and respond very well to infusion of the calcium solution intravenously, get up in a, in a way, with, you know, and they seem to, to do well. So usually uh, uh, we look at what the level of the calcium in that diet is and the availability of that calcium. What do you mean by availability? Well, we know calcium coming from dicalcium phosphate, for example, is much more available than calcium that's found, let's say, in legumes, legume haze, for example. So uh, I would look, I would double check the calcium level. I'd make sure that you had uh, the optimal level of vitamin D because vitamin D is involved in calcium and phosphorus metabolism. Not too much, not too low, but just an adequate level of vitamin D as well. And so I've seen it. And in uh, the three, notice in the lever, three, the three farms I've worked with, we basically increased calcium and that solved his dilemma. Uh, that would take several weeks for that to correct. It doesn't happen like, uh, like uh, amino acid supplementation. Okay. Good question. Thank you very much. And here is uh, Doc. Um, how should we prevent a cow from subclinical hypocalcemia? Well, I, I think, uh, Doc, there are, there are two tools that I'd recommend using. Uh, number one is going to be the DCAD. I think that that's uh, one, one approach, uh, using, using a DCAD product. Uh, the second one that goes with that is some newer research coming out. There is a zeolite product that comes from Europe that ties up calcium that causes the parathyroid to be activated and uh, mobilized bone calcium. Uh, I've asked some for research on it. What if, what's the long-term effects on calcium reserves? Have not received an answer on that one at that they're doing research trying to get an answer to that. So you've got the, the, the DCAD or calcium binder sources or manipulating calcium in a close-up ration. Penn State University is also low, said going to low calcium diets. And that's really a tough one for us. We're talking under 40, under 400 grams, uh, under 40 grams of calcium. The other product you can do to help uh, uh, minimize subclinical hypocalcemia, of course, is the calcium boluses or the calcium uh, drench um, that uh, farmers will will give to cows at calving. And that's giving a very uh, a big shot of, of, uh, of 40 or 50 grams of calcium. Usually it's calcium chloride or calcium sulfate or calcium propionate, and that gives them an extra shot of calcium. Uh, however, we, uh, we, we found that... Uh, uh, those animals that uh, were not that were somewhat of a D, were not on DCAD may not respond quite as effectively as they will when you if they were on a DCAD and then you give them that that bolus as far as that goes. To me, those are doc the two best ways to provide prevent hypocalcemia. That occurs primarily in second, third, fourth, fifth lactation cows, older cows because a uh, they can't mobilize calcium from their bones as readily. And number two, they're not as effective or efficient at absorbing calcium as would say a calf, a heifer, first calf heifer would have out there in the program okay and i think we are out of, oh, one more question here and uh i put him 
do you recommend DCAT strategy when keeping mature cow heifers together uh, and they are 50-50? The answer is yes. Notice the big, big breath. Uh, I would do that because I think it really helps my mature cows. And, and so uh, the heifers, uh, I would suggest you uh, you are going to lose that money. So if it costs you uh, $21 to treat an animal and, and half only half the animal is going to respond, then your, your responding animal is going to cost you $42. And so my answer is yes, I would do that. If they're 50-50... I, I can't get out of it. You know, I really think you're mature cows. And I, I'd say that's certainly your third, fourth, fifth lactation cows. And probably your second lactation cows need to be in one of those uh, subclinical hypocalcemic treatment programs. Because 30 or 40% of good cows are going to suffer from that. They just do. That is data that coming, it's coming out of uh, Wisconsin with Dr. Gary Etzel. So it's it's pretty common. It's a pretty pretty common one. So uh, that... Um, that's my answer, and uh, and uh, you know I, I think it's so important to the mature cows that um, I, I'm going to just invest and not get value back on my young cows. And with that, our time is gone. Uh, Santa Fe Institute indicates that uh, this is our last question for the day. I want to thank everybody for joining me. Hopefully, it has been useful for you uh, doing the case study. That's kind of our style here. Usually, we'll do a case study, have some type of a theme message that we'll put in here. Again, if you want to learn more about the class, uh, Jesse just uh, put up, Andrea put up the, the link that you can learn more about our class. Uh, anybody can join at any time. You you have access to all the information, all the recorded messages, and mm -hmm. access to me uh, once a month uh, if you're in the class. And so uh, we will uh, hopefully uh, gain a few more. Maybe you know of a colleague or a coworker or a dairy farmer who would find value here and uh, they are welcome to come to our class and have access to all the information, the 52 modules, all the uh, research updates, uh, and our recordings from these programs as well. Well, that completes our program for today. Uh, we'll hopefully see you in uh, February. Uh, stay warm if you're in uh, in Canada or you're in northern parts of the United States, or stay cool if you're in, in the southern areas of of the world as well. With that, we'll stand adjourned. Thanks very much to Jesse and Santa Fe Institute for their technical support, getting this uh, uh, up and running for us today. And you folks have a great day. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye-bye.